Welcome to Discover Aussie Kids Audiobooks. This is a live talk with some Australian narrators who have left their house very little in the past 18 months and are looking forward to going outside but spending an hour here with us first. Um, you'll notice there is a Q&A box. That is where if you have a question for our guests, you should put that question. Go ahead, ask them anything. Now is your chance. If you put it in the chat box, we might not see it. So do try to remember to put it in the Q&A box so I can ask it for you. I'm Michelle Kamm. I'm the publisher of Audiophile Magazine, which is the number one source for audiobook reviews in the world. And it's my job to kick off today's events, which is sponsored by our friends at Belinda. They have published all the titles you will hear our narrators perform live today. So let me take you to who those narrators are. One bit of sad news, unfortunately, Rosalind Odes cannot be with us today because uh, she had a family situation. We wish her well, and we look forward to having her at another event. But let's meet who we do have with us today for this lively chat. First up is Stig Weems. He has a variety of TV, theater, and film credits, as well as being a voice actor. And he's narrated more than 150 audiobooks by such authors as Andy Griffiths, Paul Jennings, Tim Winton, Morris Gleitzman, Gary Leon, or Lyon, sorry, and Felicia Arena. In addition, he's written and narrated his own children's audiobook series entitled The Trip Diaries. And he is well known for his Live at the Library program. Hi. Hi, Stig. Hello, everyone. Good to be here. Next up is Emily Wheaton. She has been working in the voiceover space for as long as she's been acting. And her voice credits include the Emmy-nominated animated series Get Ace by Galaxy Pop. She also has a strong singing voice and first tread the boards as a child in the role of Brigitta in The Sound of Music for SEL slash GFO. That's one of my favorite musicals. Having been born in the UK, Emily can work in UK dialects as well as her native Australian tongue. And we have Lawrence Boxhall. He is an Earphones Award winner, and he was what named one of the 10 best new voices in 2020 by the Publisher Association in the UK. He has voiced scores of audiobooks, including the high-spirited Vulgar the Viking Kings book series and the Grunts series. And willing to get in with the narrators here is Keenan Wadra who has been in the hot seat as an audiobook producer for six years, traveling through time, sailing rough and treacherous seas and dodging laser beams while fighting on an intergalactic space war. He'll give us some insights into the composition and how you put the audiobook together. All right, I know we want to get right to our guests, so I will let you know we are recording tonight's event and it will be on our YouTube ch channel by early next week at the latest. And we do always welcome you to visit with Audiophile on our website, audiophilemagazine.com, and also check out our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, Behind the Mic, which is our review podcast, and Audiobook Break. Right now on Audiobook Break, we are listening to The Iliad. All right, let's get started. Our first guest tonight, who's going to read something from the 130 story treehouse by Andy Griffiths, is Stig. Now, Stig, this was just on our podcast the other day, getting an excellent review. And uh, it's kind of an interesting tale. Can you give us a little bit of, you know, intro into what you're going to read for us tonight? Yeah, well, um, Andy Griffiths has been a stalwart in Australia for uh, uh, children's books for a long time now, I think probably close to 15 years. And in fact, um, he, he first came, came into the scene uh, with some, a series of books called The Just Series, which were fantastic short stories in a collection. There was a whole bunch of them, just stupid, just crazy, uh, just Macbeth. And interestingly, uh, at the time that they came out, they were looking for somebody to sort of be the voice of all the Andy Griffiths books and they auditioned a number of people and it turned out that, you know, I got the part. And so I've been narrating Andy Griffiths books for 
for all that time, every single Andy Griffiths book is, it's always me who narrates it because he's, a, he's so famous and so well known. People will like kids will hear me speak. They'll, I'll be in a supermarket and they'll hear my voice and they'll come up to me and say, are you Andy Griffiths? Like that. And, and, and I always go, yes, I am. And, um, you know, sign an autograph and pretend to be Andy. And then, uh, and, and so anyway, this, this book, the, this, the Treehouse books started at the 13 story Treehouse. That one there, which I think was probably, Keenan would be able to tell us more, but I think it probably came out about, uh, you know, six, five or six years ago. And then pretty much every year since then, he adds another 13 stories. To the book and we've currently Kenan and I just recently finished the 143 story tree house so this one is kind of later in the series it's the 130 story tree house and by now of course there's 130 levels in the in the tree house and um, we sometimes revisit some of the earlier stories but mostly each book uh, we get to explore all the craziness of whatever has been added in the new 13 levels so we'll hear in my little excerpt here a little bit about what we expect to find in the 130 story tree house. How's that, Michelle? Shall I do it? Perfect. Take it away. Okay. The 130 story tree house. Hi, my name is Andy. This is my friend, Terry. We live in a tree. Yeah, well, when I say tree, I mean tree house. And when I say tree house, I don't just mean any old tree house. I mean a 130 story tree house. Yeah, it used to be a 117 story tree house, but we've added another 13 stories. So what are you waiting for? Come on up. We've got a soap bubble blaster, a non-stop dot level, a 13 story igloo, the grabinator, it can grab anything from anywhere at any time. An extraterrestrial observation centre, a time-wasting level, a toilet paper factory, because you can never have too much toilet paper, a giant juggling octopus, a soft grassy hill perfect for rolling down, a super long legs level, a TBF, that, that, that's short for a treehouse fire brigade, a people-eating plant called Petal, and the biggest bookshop in a treehouse, in a tree, in a forest, in a book, in the whole world. Now you have to listen to the rest of it to hear what happens. Excellent. <laughs> and when we listen to these particular um, books, they have a lot of sound effects and, and music and things that go into them as well. So it's, it's quite an interesting transition, which we'll talk to Keenan about in a moment. But I want to ask you um, a question, and then we'll, we'll lead into asking our other narrators. And that question is, this book is later in the series. So how do you keep track of all of the characters? So then you can return to them, you know, from... 13 stories to 130 stories. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, to be honest, I mean, there's the main characters, the main three or three or four really main characters. Um, and they are, you know, Andy and Terry and uh, that, you know, you, you know those. And, and sometimes the, the characters from previous, uh, the previous books, they don't really appear that much. But if they do, and if I, if I, often the names are so outrageous that for some reason it just sticks in my head anyway. But often before we start the book, I'll sit down with some, with Keenan, the producer, and he'll play me back something from, you know, the 13th Story Treehouse and say, okay, he, here's how Mermaidia sounded. And just that gentle reminder can help. And I, I do this thing, I don't know what, what you other guys do, but I do this thing where I'll, I'll write down the name if I know the name of the character's going to be a book. And then I'll say something like that jogs my memory. Like I'll say, you know, um, lots of hair and um, an apron, right? And when I read that, I go, it, it creates an image in my head that I go, oh, yeah, that's right. It was like Auntie Lorna when she used to cook around the kitchen on a Sunday. And that image in my head then gives me the voice in a sense so yeah I just have a little written note a, a, a visual reminder as to what to what this voice will sound like when it comes out 
What about you, Emily? Do you do anything different to keep track of characters, especially when there's a ton of them? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, sometimes what I do is I, I uh, on my phone, I have, uh, you know, your voice memo app. I yeah. actually kind of record a little bit while I'm working on the book and then it sort of just lives on my phone. So I have like thousands of voice memos. <laughs> so you can just sort of search it through and find that character. But um, as Dick said, you know, the, the engineers are so fantastic at helping you keep track of that character, especially within the, the actual book itself. So if you sort of have someone who comes in at the beginning and then you don't hear them until the end, um, sometimes you just have a little grab of that character and then you ask them to play it back. And that's a really great way to keep it consistent. And um, But I love what you said, Stig, about having like a visual thing. Like sometimes I just have one word, like if, you know, I, I had a, a book that I did recently where I had sisters and just to sort of distinguish between those two, I just made one of them bossy. So it's just that word bossy helped me kind of find that character um, without having to kind of put on a whole other voice because they were sisters. So I wanted them to sound, you know, somewhat similar. And, you know, and that's so true too, sorry, but you know, that thing of when you're reading and it's happening immediately, that if you associate the word bossy with the with the Julia character, you can instantly go to that, like you say, without going to any huge lengths to try and create a different voice. It's just a slight separation between the sisters simply by the word bossy. It's great. Yeah, sometimes it's like the more simple, the stronger that comes through, the sim more simple the idea, the stronger the voice kind of comes through. Mm. So Lawrence, I'll ask you, you know, I've, I've seen a, a few audiobooks recorded, a number of them, and, you know, narrators often will give some kind of trigger in a color, in a, you know, iPad or something mm -hmm. like that. And something I often see is just a little change in physicality to indicate a different character. Do you ever use a change in physicality to do a different voice? Yeah, absolutely. Um it always depends on on what sort of the what the book is um often when it comes to doing um sort of high spirited kids books there's sort of a big change of physicality i i like to subtlety is not my forte so it, it does it can end up being sort of you know if it's sort of a grottier character it, i do sort of become a troll near the microphone and sort of start talking into it and, and all this sort of stuff um but I, uh, I do sort of similar stuff with highlighting on the iPad. I, I get the PDF of the book and I go through and I highlight all the different characters and that becomes their color. So I can see it at a glance. Um, and then I try not to do too much physicality because in the end, I just end up tiring myself out. <laughs> but um, then it's sort of a similar thing to, to Stig as well, where I have a, a cheat sheet, but it's, it's less the one word. I, I had to do a, a book last year set in the world of high finance and in London and you know you had these big boardroom meetings of 14 different people all you know straight wh white collar British men and it's thinking right so you can have a bunch that are similar but then you do need to be able to ping out so as opposed to having specific sort of words I'd, I'd give them characters but they're all characters so I can differentiate between them very quickly things like that are based on other characters so you know johnson would be hagrid but with a cold or <laughs> it would be you know um michael kane but he's got his thumb stuck in a drawer or something and it's just that sort of sense of oh yeah i can use someone else's voice and then put a sort of a spin on it to become a different thing yeah that's how yes and then inevitably that ends up being in changing the physicality as well I love that. I can picture Michael Caine with his finger stuck in a drawer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Michelle, can we just say, Michelle, yeah. can we just, Lawrence mentioned there that subtlety is not his forte. Can, can we just prove this, Lawrence, to the audience? Can we show everybody your slippers? We have to do that. Can we see oh, the yes. slippers? Yes, we, this can, is, we can show the slippers. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, I'm a man of uh, a great restraint, and here we are having this wonderful chat, and, and these are on my feet. Yes. My Hobbit feet it. slippers. They're fantastic. I'm going to get some. Beautiful. <laughs> well, now that we've uh, sold Hobbit's feet slippers all over the world, I'll uh, turn to Keenan. Um, talk to us specifically, you know, about the uh, the Treehouse books. They have a soundscape, and you have to transition what is really a graphic novel or a picture book into an audio many times. What are the things you have to consider as you're putting that together and creating something that leaps off the page and into your ears? There is, there is so much. Um, 
it's you know it's I've, I've worked with Stig a lot um, on these titles, and I think first of all the job that Stig does is is so so important for that. Um, how he kind of ad libs and generates kind of different ideas from the pictures that he's seeing basically helps me in turn in post production. So you know if there's like a flying elephant, like you know he'll ad lib some lines, and I can build around those things, and I can build the soundscape around Stig. Um, especially with the treehouse books, they're, they're super exaggerated. They are super over the top and they're, they're wild. They're zany. They're fun. Stig basically sets the tone and I can work off that. So building a soundscape um, can sometimes be super difficult, but can sometimes be super easy. There's, you know, having the grabinator, like Stig just mentioned, like, you know, that's all these mechanical noises and it's kind of like, you know, putting in an in, in industrial kind of space, um, you know, having a cat meow flying across if the cat, grabinators, grab the cat, it's flying across. So it's going from left to right, head from right to left and back and forth. There's a lot of swooshes and whooshes and all these kind of wild different things that help set the tone. Um, but, you know, it's, it doesn't have to be always as, as complicated as that. I mean, there was a, in the most recent um, Treehouse book, there was a, a camp campsite level and it was just as simple as like, you know, birds and bugs and crickets and atmos and some fire crackling and that's all it needed to be. Um, and then, you know, we can go super, super wild like the Grabinator and get really into, you know, you, you know, banging and clanging of hammers and jackhammers, all this kind of weird stuff. So look, it, it really is kind of dependent on, on what's called for, but I think the narrators do an absolutely fantastic job of making my job easier in post-production in kind of setting everything up. The more information that they can give me, the more kind of, you know, ad lib stuff and vocal stuff they can give me just makes my job so much easier. You know, Michelle, can I just say there, and Keenan's being very modest because at the end of the day, the Treehouse books, um, the, the audio version of the Treehouse books have been hugely successful. They've won awards, ABA awards and, and so forth. And honestly, you know, it's it's as much as, you know, I have to say the words at the end of the day, it's the, it's the work that goes in, the post-production work that goes in to creating the soundscape around these treehouse books that really make them stand out. And it's the reason that kids love them so much, you know, to, to create that theatre of the mind that Keenan just does so brilliantly. It's you just get lost in this world. You actually feel like you're watching a movie, not even listening to a book. It's really so, so important. And, you know, Andy writes in a way that allows for that landscape to exist. But then you need somebody who knows how to paint that landscape using using audio. And um, I don't know, I, I just think we do it so well. Belinda does it so well. And what Keenan does is just, it's outstanding. I'm so uh, gr grateful to be associated with the Treehouse books. And it's not because of me, it's because of the work that so many other people do. Well, we have some questions that have come in from the audience, so let's take a look at those. All right, Stig, someone says, their personal favorite is older. It's Sucked In by Paul Jennings. Yeah. As an appendix is out on its own after being removed, and Trevor, its owner, believes we must always be together, is given credence. How do you accomplish this? <laughs> you know, um, Paul Jennings is an extraordinary writer. His his stuff is always it's just like that. It's it's always so weird and often a little bit dark, and I love that. I I love that um, children's books will take take you into an area that you're sort of quite surprised that that's what they're talking about. I and mean, it can be quite sad and dark and the, the subject matter. And I mean, you know, in many many ways. Who was who's the question from? The question was uh, from an audience member oh, named so Susan. Okay. Yeah, okay. Susan. So, so Susan. So, so, you know, for me, it's like the opportunity to play the part of a body part, um, uh, you know, is, a, is an opportunity to a license to do whatever I want. You can't tell me. I can make, a, a, you know, a, an appendix sound however I want it to sound. Nobody can turn around and say to me, well, that's not how an appendix sounds, because I can say, yes, it is. I'm an appendix expert. <laughs> So I love I love the opportunity to do things like that because there's no rules you know it's it's cartoon land it's a license to just be as whatever you want to be. So someone says you are so dynamic and free. How do you know that the mic will pick up the wide range of your voice? Uh, I know that because the where we I mean Belinda prides itself on making the best. You know, the owner of Belinda once said to me that if the first time you listen to an audio book you don't enjoy it. 
if it wasn't didn't sound right, if you felt like you didn't connect to the narrator, then the chances are you're going to lose that potential audience member forever. But if the first time you listen to an audiobook, we tick every box. It's the casting's perfect, the narrator's voice is right for this story, and the sound is pristine. You get lost in that story, then that's it. You've got a listener for life. And anyone who has discovered audiobooks knows it's an absolute joy. Where you know when I'm preaching to the converted, talking to this audience. But, um, and, you know, and so I, you just trust that the environment that you, you are in, it's the least of my worries. What I know I have to do is to deliver, step up, make sure my appendix sounds just like an appendix. <laughs> <laughs> and we had some questions emailed in before, so I have a favorite one. Um, Stig, it, it asks, are you outgoing in real life? No, no, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very demure and very shy and very introverted. <laughs> And I find it difficult even to go into a supermarket and, and, and ask for um, help. So what is the best prank you've played on someone? Well, full, full disclosure here, I guess I should say. Um, I, because I do go out into, into um, schools and libraries and, uh, and I also read books, for a while there I actually got very, very busy and couldn't necessarily always meet commitments. So... Uh, <laughs> I hired an actor to play me, to, to read my books and to go and I just, he happened to look like me and sound like me. So I, I would pay him. To, and in fact, Stig was actually um, busy today. So I'm actually not Stig, I'm, I'm Wayne Briggs. And um, I was just, but he's, shall I go and get him? Sure, of course. He's, I'll, I'll just get him. He's just arrived. I'll go. <laughs> and we can see that um, he is not outgoing at all in real life. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. No worries. Sorry. Sorry about that. How's it been going? How's the webinar been going? Thanks, excellent. Right. Wayne has been excellent and doing, Thanks, doing Wayne. well. I'll fix you up, mate. You're awesome. Nice guy. Like a bit, of, bit weird like loves body parts and stuff but nice guy yeah yeah so anyway I don't know what the question was but that's the answer fantastic <laughs> all right we're going to transition over to Emily who is going to read from the Griffin Gate by Vashti Hardy and would love again a little insight into what you're going to read for us sure um absolutely so um the Griffin Gate series is about um about a family of wardens and uh, it's it's sort of set in a I suppose a parallel universe or it could be sometime in the future um, and uh, it's yeah it's about uh, this family who have the ability to they have a special map and they have the ability to go anywhere um, people like ring the map I guess and ask for the help and so the family can kind of press a press a light on the map and then they get zapped into wherever it is that the people have asked for help. And it, it follows um, Grace Griffin, who's the youngest member of the family. And in the first book, we're sort of finding her discovering, you know, um, her, her abilities for the first time. She's not a fully qualified warden yet. And um, in this little passage, we sort of see her for the first time deciding she's gonna, she's gonna take a call. Um, spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah, um, even though she's, she's not quite qualified yet. And, um, yeah, so it's a great story. It's a it's a really fun kind of look at yeah at, at a different world with lots of different gadgets and things. So great, okay. we look we look forward to. Okay. <clears throat> Grace hurried over to the table. The light was in a small village to the far north, marked Mudford. Someone there needed help. A strange fizzling started in Grace's stomach. Perhaps this was her chance to prove that the age rule was silly. There was no real reason why Grace couldn't answer a call. She'd had as much training as Bren. The light changed to red. It was an emergency. Someone needed help right now. Bren was speaking to the man at the front door and mum was at the mayor's. They couldn't blame her for trying to help, surely. Don't even think about it, Watson said, flapping his wings to land on Grace's shoulder. Bret! Watson started calling. Swiftly, Grace clamped her hand around his beak. Her mind was made up. 
This was her chance to prove herself. She glanced around and saw that Bren had left his recompass on the arm of his chair. Still holding Watson's beak, Grace dashed over and stuffed the recompass into her pocket. Then she saw the stun stick she'd just mended beside it and shoved it in her ankle pocket. Watson's muffled protests wouldn't stop her. She dashed back to the map and touched the flashing gate. Da -da -da -da. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So this title in particular is referred to as having a light, airy tone. So how do you figure out and approach the tone of the book as you head into the booth? It's such a great question. Um, I think, you know, for me, the first thing I like to do when I have a new book in front of me is just to read it like as a reader rather than as a narrator. And I, I really try to listen to the voice that's coming through in my head from the page, from the author. So like the author's voice. And, um, and listening to that gives me a little bit of a feel for, for how the book flows. And, and then I try, when I vocalize, I try to capture that and try to translate that. Um, yeah, and, and it, sometimes there's some clues in the text itself, like with the Griffin Gate, the sentences are quite short, it's quite sharp. And I think that's what gives it that light airiness that you described there, it's, it comes through off the page, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Um, I'm going to ask Keenan, our producer, you know, oftentimes you are presented with all sorts of different, um, you know, names and words and places in a fantasy book. How do you help the narrator prepare for those words? I know for me, it's hard to read fantasy with my eyes because I just would say that, you know, look at the first letter and not be able to say the name of the planet. <laughs> It's, um, it's quite amazing how often you read something in text and you'll just kind of glance over it and you'll see the word. It could be a place name, a person's name, and you never really kind of make that connection as to what that word is or what that name or how it's pronounced. And when reading an audio book, and I'm sure every, you know, every one of these narrators here can attest to it, is that you kind of get stuck. Like, oh, hang on a minute. I never kind of maybe gave that thought as to what that might be, what it sounds like. So in these situations, it's always super, super awesome if we can get directly in contact with the author or the publisher of the book and they can give us, you know, a, you know, a perfect way on how to say it. Um, and that's great. And we can roll with that. Some other times, you know, authors might be a little bit kind of like, well, you know, we, I actually haven't decided how I want it to be said. Um, you know, does the location of the book or the setting of the book determine how that should be said is a you know a language barrier thing stopping it from being said a certain way so it's all those kind of things we weigh up but i think the main thing is when we find that out so whether it is getting in contact with the author or making a you know clear and concise decision between producer and narrator we always want to remain consistent so if it's the first book in the series we want to make sure that, that name is pronounced the same from the very first book all the way through to you know however however many books there are and all comes down to note taking is really just kind of making sure that on my iPad, when I'm reading along with the narrators, I'm making ample notes. And, you know, like um, Emily was just saying, voice notes is, is another great thing. Um, and just kind of, yeah, making sure that we're always being accountable and we're making sure that we're getting the exact pronunciation every single time. And look, you know, with um, different uh, voices and different kind of character voices, pronunciations can sway a little bit. And that's, that's kind of cool too. Um, but yeah, we, we're just trying to make sure that we're getting it right all the time um and yeah the best the best way uh, is from the author directly if we can what, what if they don't know <laughs> well yeah what is, well that's the thing i, I think we, we kind of make a you know a really kind of clear choice between you know we use our own discretion and we kind of go all right this is how it kind of should sound um and i guess after that is making sure that it just kind of remains consistent and i and i guess ties in well with the book as well uh, I, I guess is the other thing so there was a great compliment that came into the Q&A uh, for Belinda. Um, at the end of each Belinda audiobook, there's a message encouraging, reader, encouraging readers to send an email to a favorite author or narrator, uh, you know, to, via Belinda, and it will be sent on to this person. And, you know, everyone feels that that's a really unique and special thing about Belinda and in, invites the listener in. I don't know, Keenan, if you were involved in that in that choice, but uh, a great compliment from our audience. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, I mean, it, I've, I've had letters come through um, my desk to, to forward on to narrators. And yeah, it's great. It's really, really great to know. And I'm sure, once again, the narrator's going to attest to this. It's, 
it's always great to hear back from the audience and people listening to these books because sometimes we never really kind of know how they're being you know except we don't hear the review firsthand so to to really have people let us know that they're enjoying the books is yeah it's fantastic so this question for all the narrators and we'll start with you stig um do you approach narrating children's books any different from narrating a book for an adult audience um to be honest i don't really do a lot of adult books i do young adult books and um and, and I, I really love doing those young adult books. Often they're coming of age books. And because that's a period in everybody's life that we really remember, it's such an important part of our life that changing from um, a teenager or from a, a child really into a young adult, you know, suddenly all sorts of things are awakened within, within us. Regardless of who's written the book, there's always a really great story to be had. Um, I recently narrated um, a book called Boy Swallows Universe uh, by Trent Dalton, which was a um, fabulous first novel by um, a new Australian writer that just it won all sorts of awards as a book because it was so captivating and brave, really, so brave. And um, I think it's so different compared to, say, a, a treehouse book and then something like Boy Swallows Universe where there's just a bit more gravitas to the book, whereas with the, it's like you know doing a treehouse book is like you know it's a cartoon a comic and it's a, a license to be sort of crazy whereas I think the big difference is that for something like Boy Swallows Universe yes you want to find the truth in all those characters but um, it, it, it is more about you know really living the, living the, the true life of somebody rather than um, taking it to its nth degree where you're literally just trying to find the humor within it but I like both I like both the chance to do both and um, you know if anybody wants to offer me Keenan uh, an adult book I'll take the wig off and I'll have a crack at it for you but in the meantime I'm happy to do kid stuff. <laughs> what about you Lawrence do you approach anything differently from uh, adult to children's? Not, not really in, in terms of, of preparation or anything like that. But when it comes to the, I, more or less echoing what, what Stig said, you know, it, it always, even when you're doing the, the, the comedy of, of, of children's books, if they're, you know, if they're supposed to be a, a you know, a, a funny kid's book, it, kids, they can tell when it isn't, they, I think they can tell when you're trying to force it. So it always still has to come from a place of truth. And so it, it is, you know, um it's just about sort of dialing in on on what what level of truth that you're you're trying to convey and you know the character's intention and 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 what they what they want and um and what they're trying to achieve and um cuz yeah and, and it's just the same with 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 narrating for you know um, um more more grown up books is the um is that but you're just trying to create I think a, probably a, a, a closer sense of sort of this comfortable intimacy where where you know for, for children it's it's almost like you're performing to the to the class or something but then for adult books I think it's it's more about trying to have this very very one-on-one -on -one sort of relationship with the listener um at least that's 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 what I do where where uh, I'm not sure I, I like to imagine that I'm just sort of strangely sitting by this person who's lying in bed this fully grown adult and I'm just reading them a bedtime story um, <laughs> which is a terrifying image but um, that's kind of yeah that's really the only change is just is just it's all still trying to find the truth but it's just um yeah just sort of being being less less I don't I don't so much become a troll by the microphone for adult books. Emily what about you any differences? I, I say I do approach them differently. And I think it we've comes... lost your. Can you hear me? Now we can. Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I would say I do approach I do approach children's and adults' books differently, and I think it comes from you know the energy of the book itself. Um, there's sort of a, a stillness with adult books um, that it just takes you into a different part of yourself when you're reading it. Whereas with children's books, there's a sort of a freedom, like an energetic freedom that comes. Um, and I think that's what you're talking about, Lawrence, you know, the, your body kind of becomes a little bit more free. And, and so there is a difference, I think, for me in the energy that you use to approach each book. 
But, but it's interesting, isn't it, Michelle, that the common denominator through all of that, what we've all just said there, is truth. And I think that's the real key to it is that, you know, if you can find the, the truth within the page uh, and then, you know, br bring that forward, but base it in truth, then you're, it's sort of a licence to be as big as you want for children's books or as subtle as you want for, uh, for older uh, books that are aimed at older people. Mm, and there's kind of a thing there between those two things. Like sometimes with an adult book, there is kind of a character who comes alive in a, in a bit more of a um, energetically free way. And, and same in children's books, sometimes there's a, there's a subtleness that can come in. Mm. Yes, I think that's a, a, a great thing to think about, that finding the truth. Now, unfortunately, it looks like we've lost Lawrence. So we will... Um, Hope for him to come back in. And in the meantime, um, we will keep chatting. Uh, one of the questions that had come in in advance um, was, how do you get yourself in the zone for an audio recording? Is it easy to switch that performance on and off when you're in front of the mic? Stig, what do you think? Um, look, you know, I mean, I've been doing it for a while. So for me, for me, it's like, I mean, I just really look forward to it, you know, on the drive to, Belinda uh, to wherever the studio is. There's a couple of Belinda studios over town now. So on the drive there, I'll be thinking about what I'm about to do. And then I think the moment that you get into the studio, there's a little bit of ceremonial stuff about, you know, getting the mic right with the producer and putting on the headphones and setting your lighting right. Everybody likes it a little bit different. And, um, you know, when you get into that zone and then it's it really, it's like that then becomes your theatre, your stage for the next three to four hours. This is your place of performance so you take ownership over it and you do transform into this little world where it's you and another person on the other side of the glass and together you're going to share the next three or four hours together and create something I mean that's the other thing is that every everybody I work with at Belinda and every other narrator really I've ever spoken to is that when you get the opportunity to read a book you just want it to be the best it can be and so you know for, it's all about working with somebody else to make something fabulous you know you want it to be great and so yeah I think you do go into a different space it's not the same as just um going to I don't know do a voiceover for an ad or something like that for a tv commercial it's much more it's much more like doing theatre, like turning up at the theatre at seven o'clock and get, going backstage, getting makeup on, get, getting ready to, to, you know, start a show. So, Emily, I'll ask you, you know, what do you do when you're having a book that is very heavy in what you're dealing with? Um, do you take that? Do you take your work home with you in that case? Um, that's a great question. I, I think not. Um, I think I think. Yeah, I think not. I think I like to leave it there. I mean, there's a part of you, you carry around the book for the duration of the time that you're working on it, don't you? And sometime afterwards, sometimes. Um, but I think, yeah, I think it's good not to sort of carry any heaviness of a character. I think um, I don't find that difficult for some reason. I, I, I kind of like to be able to step into something and step out of it again, um, personally. Yeah. Can, I get, Emily, can I ask you, Emily, to, um, I found this with Voice Wars Universe that, um, uh, you know, I got to certain parts of the book and I was so caught up in the storytelling and what was happening to these characters that I actually got emotional, which I actually don't think is right for the listener to hear that there's too much emotion. You know, you, as much as you need to be, you know, in the story and in, in it, I, I don't think it's right that you are too emotional. Do you find you get that? Do you get emotional sometimes? Or Yeah, sometimes. And I think... Yeah. Um, I think sometimes you have to just take a tiny little break, don't you, from your recording. And sometimes the first time you read it through, you can get a bit emotional and you can say to the engineer, actually, let's go back to the start of this little part and have a breath. And I think, because I think you're so right. I think if you're feeling too much, I think the audience doesn't feel as much for some reason. There's something that happens there. And what, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's right, because I just for some reason, I, do, I mean, it's absolutely right that you have to be, I call it falling through the hole in the page where you, are, you know, you're, you're in the story. So, and I think that really comes through when you listen to an audio book, you can tell the narrators that are genuinely within the, the pages of the book. But, but I do think there's a fine line that if you, if you go too far, um, 
allowing yourself to show too much emotion can almost work against, it can take the, uh, the listener out of the book because they suddenly are thinking, oh, the narrator's really losing it and, or, you know, the, the narrator's really quite emotional in that bit. I do think a little bit of it is right and it's, it, it's sort of a fine call, isn't it? But, yeah, it's just, I'm just interested to know what other people do. And there were times during Boy Swallows Universe where um, I had to stop and I had to say to the, to the producer, he said, just give me a minute. Give me a minute. <laughs> Which is not good. I don't think that's good, is it? I don't know. I think it's good that you're experiencing that emotion as you, you know, within yeah. the text. That sounds yeah. healthy, Stig. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> He's back, well, so, everybody. It's a, uh, yeah, sorry about that. I think we lost power in my apartment, so the Wi-Fi went down. I'm sorry about that. Oh, no, come on. perfectly timed. Slippers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, I had to put on my dino feet slippers. Um, <laughs> But it's, I'm not sure how, whether you covered this before I rejoined, but I think a lot of it is also the perspective in which the story is being told, whether it's first person or third person mm. as well, to sort of influencing the degree of whether you are this character experiencing it or whether you're this sort of objective third party observing what's happening. That's very true. Very true. I agree, Lance. Yeah, that's very cool. Very true. All right, Lawrence, now that you're back, we're going to put you on the spot. Now I've had my grand <laughs> entrance. <Yeah. laughs> Um, we are going to have Lawrence read from Digger and Me by Ross Roberts. So, uh, uh, do you want me to, uh, would you like me to sort of say what the story is about? Yes, or do you want me a, to jump little, right on in? Give a little bit of what you're going to tell us right. and then, then jump right in. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so Digger and Me, yes, is written by Ross Roberts and it's this, um, it's a really very heartwarming story, um, and also a very difficult story about this young boy, James, and he spends half his time between his mum's house and his dad's house. His parents have divorced and he's, you know, he's a very young man um, trying to grapple with the idea of, um, of his world being split in two and, and both of his parents, you know, moving on and finding different partners and um, he's very quiet at school. He's very withheld. He, there's, he's, there's some bullying that happens at school and he's having a bit of a rough time of it all. But his one sort of, his stay throughout everything is his dog Digger, this golden retriever. And the book is told across a month, across these um, diary entries almost. He, they, they, each chapter is a date and some chapters are very, very short. It's not like he's writing in a diary, but it's sort of told. Um, chronologically in this this diary form and um it's he's confides everything in his dog and then one day when he's stroking digger he uh finds a lump on digger's leg that wasn't there before and then it becomes this sort of across the month of you know going to the vet slots and um having to deal with this very real part of of life which is loss and um Yes, uh, it's um, it's not exactly laugh a minute, but it is a really, really gorgeous story. Um, and it's set in Manchester in England, right up north. And um, it's, yeah, it's just a gorgeous story about a, a young boy and his dog trying to sort of navigate, navigate a very difficult time in his life. Um, give, us, give us a taste, if you would. Give it a taste. <clears throat> I close the book. Digger lifts his head. So I open it again and read the poem to him very quietly. He rests back down. When I'm finished, I stroke his golden head over and over. There's a sort of dome bit there, which I love. And it shines when you really smooth the fur. You're my home, Digger, I say. He stands up as if he thinks we're going to play. So I get up and lie on the bed and he jumps up with me. He's a bit big for this now, but we've always played on the bed ever since he was a puppy. There's a knock at the door. You're right, mate. It's dad. Can I come in? I don't answer. The door opens slowly and dad comes in and shuts it behind him. What are you doing on there? He says, staring at Digger. 
but his voice is quiet and gentle. Dad sits on the edge of the bed, his legs stretched out in front of him. I grabbed the blue book quickly and took it under the duvet, out of sight. Everything okay, he says. A nod and cuddle into Digger. There we go. Lovely. So, I mean, you're dealing with grief. You're also dealing with a character that's significantly younger than you. Mm. How do you connect with characters who, you know, you're... You're past that in age. Oh, I'm only 14. I mean, <laughs> it's not that much younger. No, um, I, th I think a lot of it is, I, I, I you know, I, I, I do vividly remember that, that point in my life um, and, and what it's like to be um, that age viewing the world, which, which certainly helps. Um, and it helps because, you know, particularly with this book it it is written so well that most of my job is done for me and and it it helps that um it's written in first person as well because that gives you a very direct insight into how the how the characters are how james um is feeling and how he views the world so it's just trying to find this gentle marriage between my own experience and, and what i recollect and and then try and and just fuse it with with what Roz Roberts is is um, so beautifully just sort of setting out for me to, it's like she's put out the the stepping stones across this river and I go, oh, okay, I stand there, I stand there, I stand there. And whether I choose to hop, skip or jump or run along it or, you know, pirouette or whatever, I can do that because the footing is there and I know it's all there in front of me. Then I, you can just use this scaffold. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I remember what it was like when my parents read me bedtime stories as well. And I just sort of have to think about what, what I liked hearing and when we'd listen to audiobooks in the cars and sort of go, oh, okay. So then it's about taking, um, yes, my lived experience and then what Ros Roberts has put out in front of me and then kind of going, okay, and how would I like this story to have been told? And then just trying to sort of um, sit into that a little bit. And we have a question from the audience about um, Digger and me. Mm. Most enjoyable, um, this audience member says, is the so-called movie man who sounds like a real movie trailer or overly excited sports announcer. Yes. And he comments to James on a variety of topics and always adds levity. But that this is so well done, it never distracts, but it adds to the story. How do you accomplish that? Uh, that's, that's, yes. So just for context, so... Um, uh, James watches films with his dad and he watches movies and, and sometimes he'll imagine this, this very stereotypical blockbuster movie voice um, either narrating, he's watching it on screen and then he'll sometimes imagine it narrating what's happening in his life, you know, the, this summer, fire, fury, one man, one decision, that kind of thing. And, and I, I don't know, I, part of me is thinking, part of me when, when I was doing that, was I wanted to put that in slightly for any parents that might be listening as well, um, because because it, that that's such a sort of a product of um, you know the '90s, early 2000s, the '80s as well. Is that we don't really hear that kind of movie announcement voice anymore, and sure. so I thought, oh, that'll be fun to kind of really lean heavy into that. But again, it comes back to the perspective of he. This is exactly what James is hearing as well. So it's just trying to be honest about it. Um, uh, it's not like he's skewing in at his imagination. He's quite explicit in what he hears and the way that James describes it to himself. Um, so it's really just sort of following the blueprint again and, and just trying to make it honest. I'm, I'm very glad that you like it. Um, it's because I, I was having a good time um, doing that. <laughs> <laughs> and it is, and it, it's about recognizing as well that in, in such a serious book, and there are wonderful moments of levity and there's gorgeous characters in this, um, of just going, okay, that's a, that's a very gentle reprise. That's just a slight breath. That's just a little leaning back and allowing that and, and not, not weighing into it so hard that it becomes pantomime or anything, but just allowing it the moment that it deserves in order to give any listener, whether they're young, you know, I hope that, you know, young folk, in, you know, find that bit funny as well, but um, just giving it its sort of its due diligence. 
of um of uh of the moment so then we can settle back down into more serious topics again gives you somewhere to go in order to come back excellent and emily i'm curious uh, what types of things you do with your voice and body to portray younger characters um what do i do i i i guess it sits in a higher part of me like a lighter part of me um so i suppose sometimes i sort of find like a bit of a high pitch depending on how old the character is you know i did a book last week that was there was a two-year-old in it <laughs> so that was really fun trying to find this really little place and i think you do sort of find your body shifting and um yeah shifting and and, and finding that sort of something else something and I, I do I do do a lot of voices, you know, at home and in my life. And, and so it's nice to be able to use that, you know, to kind of, I think I, I carry around a lot of young people inside me all the time, <laughs> for better or worse. So it's nice to be able to have them have an outlet. That's kind of one of the most amazing things about this job. Yes, if it's Stig, of course, he's outsourcing it to uh, Wayne. And uh, there you go. So um, we have a, you know, a, a tough question from the audience. I'm putting all of you on the spot. And that is, what books did you love as children? Audio books? Uh, I think it can be a book or an audio book, you know. We listened to a lot of audio books when I was growing up. And I love the Just Williams series. Mm. Um, they're just fantastic uh yeah and um and also Roald Dahl absolutely adore Roald Dahl and had those read to us as well and they're fantastic yeah yeah I like Roald Dahl too but um I think for me it was probably in Ian of Blyton I think I, this famous five secret seven I don't yes. know I just like we got lost in all that stuff I wanted to be in one of those gangs so badly and you know yeah I think that was probably the biggest influence for me personally I, I was a, I like you, Emily, as well. We, we had a, the full set of Just William cassettes that we'd listen to in the car. Um, uh, we listened to um, uh, the um, uh, series of unfortunate events, and, oh, wow. and of course, like uh, the the sort of the, the un unreachable greatness that is Stephen Fry narrating Harry Potter, which I oh. think we're all we're all just following in his shadow, really. Um, Absolutely. Amazing. Uh, yeah, and and uh, yes, and then like my my parents did a very wonderful job of growing up um, d when we were still doing bedtime stories, which you know only ended last week. Um, uh, yeah, they would do all the voices and do all the all the bits, and it was always so entertaining that I think as well. It's just yeah, anything that they read was was excellent. It seems like you all had a lot of audio in your upbringing which is fantastic. Now, mm. Keenan, you listen to a lot of different things. Did you have a favorite as a kid and maybe have a favorite now too? I have the most fond memory um, of a family holiday. Um, rented a big four wheel drive. We headed to Southeast Victoria. It was a few hours away. Um, and it was, I just had to Google it in the background to make sure the name of Kim Laden. There was, he did a few cassette tapes and it was um, Band-Aid, and McMuscles and like how Stig, you know, does his work. It, it's just super over the top and there's the most wild voice and it's just super funny. And I remember from, from then, I think that's when it really kind of hit me how funny and engaging audiobooks can be and how far you can be taken away when you're in such a confined space. So that was definitely my favorite. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I've been doing this for, you know, six years, maybe just over six years now. And I've listened to countless um audiobooks and you know record countless audiobooks and um it varies it really it really kind of does vary you do get you know the super engaging fantasy books um you, you know fiction non-fiction i mean there was a world war ii book um i think it was philip shuler and it was just a, you know his recounts a diary recounts of, of his time in world war ii and you know it, just a crazy insight so there's, there's yeah I, I can't i guess pinpoint one but um yeah, a lot. There's, there's been so many. I mean, you know, obviously the tree, I'm a big fan of treehouse books, not because I just get to work on them, but they are so much fun. So um, yeah, too many to name, I guess. 
Well, we've certainly heard a lot of fun and seen a lot of fun in the uh, physicality here tonight. Um, what's great about Belinda, I would say, in addition to the, the nice message at the end, is that they are bringing some of these titles, which are not necessarily available in print, here to the US. So the, the market goes around the world, and you get to expose kids and families and adults to the wonderful voices and the, the wonderful accents and to some titles that we might not be aware of. So that's super cool. All right. Um, I have one final question. And that's about transitions. You know, transitions in books like um, Digger, Lawrence, you know, are very effective. Does the text really tell you how to do that? Or are you figuring out that with, you know, the director and the engineer? Um, which direction do you go in there? In terms of transitions, do you mean like from chapter to chapter? Or from emotion? Um, oh, yeah, you know. right. Um, uh, on something like Digger, um, well, what was great about um, doing Digger is because it only takes place over a month and, and uh, each chapter heading is the date, you get a very, very clear timeline of what's happening. And so for that, it was a case of looking at it and realize, and trying to figure out how, how much time has passed between each of these events, whether they're good or bad. And then just trying to figure out, um, as I was you know, doing all my highlighting and everything, um, where that's then sitting in him and where his attitudes are. Um, I, th I think when it comes to books that aren't so explicit or perhaps they take place over months or years, um, then there's a little bit more uh, a license. And in that case, it, I think it becomes um, sort of, um, how do you just not become one note sometimes, make sure that the performance is still engaging, whether it is kids' books or, or adult books. But in something like Digger, it was, it was nicely just sort of, again, just laid out where you go, oh, okay, this happened the very next day from, you know, finding the lump, he is going to be in a place of great distress and it's told from first person and, you know, he's still frantic. And then, you know, compared to that, to the one that's two weeks from now, that is a bit more processed and everything. Um, yeah, yeah, but there isn't much, at least on that one, it wasn't much consultation, um, just because it was, um, it was sort of nicely, nicely blueprinted out for me, yeah. Well, thank you all. I think we have learned a lot tonight from the perspective of listeners and also from the perspective of narrators who are recording their own titles. I think there were some great gems in there. And Stig, you have to thank uh, Wayne for us as well. Oh, yeah, well, he's, uh, he's just gone down the shop, but he, yeah, he, he, he sends his best. But, uh, yeah, thanks. That's great. You know, actually, can I just say to Michelle that it's yeah. been great watching Emily and um, Lawrence read like that. I think, as a, you know, you don't get the opportunity to watch somebody. You listen and you, in, I suppose, in your mind, you, you can see, sort of see them. But you could see, couldn't you, when both of those really talented people were reading those books, you could see their faces change. You could see how they were in the moment, like we were talking about before, you know, when, when, um, when the James' dad came into the room um, Lawrence took on a dad look about him. I thought it's fascinating, isn't it, that you, your body changes that much because you're so engaged in, in being the character or telling the story. Yeah, it was really interesting. It was great to, to be a part of this and to see that. They were absolutely really fantastic reads, by the way. Like, yeah, I mean, it was really great from my perspective to not have to kind of focus on, you know, a manuscript and kind of, you know, oh, they're making a mistake. Like, you know, yeah. Lawrence, you, know, you completely took me away there, mate. Like, I'm you know that minute I just kind of forgot what I was doing and, and you know just the pauses in between and that kind of that, that subtle emotion it's yeah it was really really good so well oh, done thank guys. you very much thank you I, I think Stig or, or Wayne I, I can't remember who was speaking oh Wayne's back but yeah thanks no worries. I'll, I'll invoice you yeah please Sorry. pass on <laughs> I loved your reading before Wayne but I think I think what Stig was Stig was right it, 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 exactly right it's for something that's such an intimate art form where you are speaking very closely to someone's ear you so really get to see the machinations behind it and for those who do all sorts of audiobooks across all different genres you know you, you go see it on a play or see something on tv or whatever but yeah it's it's i've never seen someone else narrate anything before so it was i mean it was fascinating really yeah 
it's so true like I often when I first got the job I would sit with Stig and he'd show me teach me what to do and stuff and like he's amazing he's so generous and kind funny and just a lovely lovely guy I'm so lucky to work with him but that was the first time I really got anyone to see anyone narrate and yeah I've sort of modeled my stuff on what he does because he's just he's insanely good but I think soon you know he'll be trying to get you to play uh you, he'll be playing you soon because I think you'll put him out of a job soon Wayne oh well thank you thank you I uh, listen if you ever get busy and you need somebody to fill in I can get my hair cut and you know we'll exchange get- numbers yeah, that'd be great. I'm happy to, I could, I could work on my English accent and a deeper voice and I'll get slippers. <laughs> well, we've just proved why these, these uh, webinars are great to do because we can see someone have those transitions of voice and physicality and see the art of recording an audiobook. Uh, we know it is kind of lonely there in the booth, um, but we are bringing you into the light here today. And I'd love to thank, you know, of course, all of our speakers, all the staff at Audiophile, and of course, Belinda, who make all of this possible by publishing these amazing titles. Thanks to all of you and to the audience. Remember that we are recording this so you can watch this on the Audiophile Magazine YouTube channel. Tell your friends they have great things to learn here and great things to see. All right, good luck to everyone getting back out into the universe. And thank you all. Have a lovely morning in Australia. And to our audience on the East Coast and the West Coast of the US, have a lovely evening. Thanks, Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you.